Now, Mariam, you started your TED Talk, actually, with a personal story um, when you were working as a lawyer and you met a client for the first time. I was wondering if you could share that story with our audience and then maybe talk about why that moment was a sort of light bulb for you, or set off a light bulb that you knew you wanted to work in this area. In terms of that story, um, I have many stories, trust me. So I was reflecting on the fact that early on in my career as a corporate lawyer, I had this one particular interstate client. And of course, being the chatterbox that I am, I you know, had spent months building rapport with her over the phone and over email, and I was the lead advisor on her matter. And, and so she'd spoken to me, you know, hours on end on the phone. But then we finally got to meet face to face. And so I walked into the meeting room and I said, hello. And um, she kind of gave me this odd look and she said, oh, you must work for Mariam. And, um, obviously, I wasn't smuggling a watermelon back then, so. Um, <laughs> but I, I guess the point was that she, the voice that she had heard on the phone didn't correspond to this person that was standing in front of her. And, um, yeah, it was just, uh, I felt, you know, it kind of killed my confidence a little bit because she assumed I was someone else, um, and, and particularly that the voice that she'd heard didn't seem to correspond as someone who looked like me. And so I found myself losing a little bit of confidence again, having to work really hard to build that rapport, mm -hmm. um, and then having to kind of explain who I am and, and then doubting myself. And I think the thing um, to reflect on is that minority groups spend something like up to 30% of their time worrying about how to fit in. So that's a lot of wasted productivity, a lot of wasted energy about what to say, second guessing yourself, questioning how you're speaking, you know, what's coming out of your mouth because you want to make a particular impression. And so I guess the point for me in that moment was people do make assumptions and, and stereotype others and it's not only unhealthy from their perspective, but also from the person who's on the receiving end. Mm. So you, you were trained and you were working as a corporate lawyer, and then now you work as a diversity and inclusion um, in, in corporations and, and big companies. Um, and I guess your experience is about well, having such a, an understanding of how much of a waste of time or having to worry about all of that sort of stuff is. What are some of the other like ramifications or the other sort of downfalls of this lack of diversity or this sort of lack of inclusion in the workforce? How does that play out? Um, I think ensuring that you've got diversity at every level, so I'm not just talking entry level, but in particular into leadership levels, it's actually um, produces diversity of thought. Mm -hmm. um, and that from a business perspective is incredible. We need that. Um, we're, you know, we're facing a changing economy, we've got the gig economy, things are operating differently to how they used to. To be innovative, you need to have the diversity of thought, and that comes about from having general diversity. And it's about then acknowledging the barriers that exist for diverse minority groups and why they're not moving through the ranks. Um, a lot of this, you know, research and just insights that we have are that at an entry level, lots of corporations are incredibly diverse. I'm talking every diversity stream. But as you start to move through the ranks of leadership, it's not reflected. And it's, you know, that diversity is not reflected. And so you're missing out on several aspects. One, it's the moral and the right thing to do to make sure that everybody has an equitable opportunity to move ahead. But two, um, there's plenty of studies that prove that diversity at a board level, and at a leadership level, produces innovative results and is really good for your bottom line. Mm. So it's, you know, it makes business sense. So on that, I mean, you mentioned that there's a lot of space, I suppose, for diversity and people are trying to work on that more and that you're seeing that play out maybe at the entry level, but that when you look at our TVs or you look at university professors or you look at business CEOs or you look at 
you know, pretty much at every level. Australia isn't a very, well, that, rep that diversity of Australia isn't represented mm -hmm. on that sort of visible top tier of our country. Mm -hmm. Something that you said that really struck me as kind of terrifying was that a lot of our decisions that we make, and especially decisions that get made in the workforce, are actually subconscious. And I was wondering if that, was that a connection that you have drawn, that the fact that we subconsciously are kind of self-selecting or something? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so I spoke about unconscious bias in particular, and, and that, you know, um, I was, Eric Candle, it was Nobel Peace Prize recipient, and said that up to 90% of the brain's function is actually unconscious. And so I guess the point I want to make is that um, having unconscious thoughts isn't necessarily always a bad thing. It, you know, for example, um, when you're driving, you know, the first few times you put a lot of conscious effort into learning and you concentrate, and then after a while, um, you can literally do it with your eyes closed, although I don't recommend it. Um, <laughs> but the, the point is, it becomes unconscious, right? And so, so the brain does have a lot of shortcuts, and that's not necessarily a bad thing, but if those shortcuts that your brain has learned over time, and it starts at a really young age, if those shortcuts or those rules are wrong or have bias or prejudice in it, then it's really hard to unteach that. It's like uh, learning driving rules incorrectly <laughs> and you've been doing it for years and then you have to wire your brain not to do that. And that's the thing about unconscious bias, right? Um, unconscious thoughts aren't always a bad thing, but if you're, if you're associating, you've got these unconscious associations with certain things, like for example, whether it's gender, so you have all these gender stereotypes that you've grown up with that you don't even think about. Um, you know, that can be a negative thing. If you've got all these associations around race, for example, that can be a negative thing. And that's, it comes out when you are in the recruitment process, for example, or you are making decisions. And so, you know, you, were, you referenced earlier about the top ranks of leadership and how we're not necessarily seeing that diversity. And you've got to then think about over the last, you know, historically, how did we get to this point where that diversity isn't reflected there? And there's, I think the element of unconscious and perhaps conscious bias comes into it. Mm. A lot of work that you're doing, I think we, or especially the young people in the audience, are going to be very happy that, you know, you forged ahead and tried to make these changes because um, you mentioned a study that uh, is quite old, I think, now, but maybe mm. 10 or 15 years ago, there was a study, right, that um, was the exact same CV, and they just changed the names at the top. They did it with men and women, and I think there was a Western name, an Asian-sounding name, and a Middle Eastern-sounding name. And Asian or Middle Eastern, you'll have to correct me with the yeah, extra yeah. numbers, but you had to, the same resume had to get uh, submitted, up, you know, 50% more or something, yeah, even so to get an interview. That's right, and they did it with Indigenous names as well, and they also trialled it with Italian names as well. And what they found was um, the Asian-sounding names um, had to apply 68% more times to get the same number of callbacks as an Anglo-Saxon-sounding name. And then if you had a Middle Eastern-sounding name, 64% more times. And then if you had an Indigenous name, it was 35% more times. And I think even an Italian name was 12% discrimination. And so this that's is all, like, yeah, this no. is kind of like unconscious decisions uh, where we think that person's not right for that job, or? Yeah, I mean, it could be an, an unconscious component, it could be a conscious bias, but the reality back when this study was done was that those individuals with those names had to try harder. And so the reality was they wouldn't know that they weren't getting callbacks. But when you do this research in that way and you submit the exact same resume, so you can't even say it's not because you don't have merit, because they were the same resumes, the same qualifications and same education. And so the reality is that we know bias exists and that some of this bias is a lot more prominent when it comes to certain races and particularly gender as well, we know that. Um, so then, you know, how do you change that? How do you, and I'm hoping that if they replicated the study today that, that um, it, hopefully it wouldn't be as bad, but this is where something that, that it, the industry is trialling is anonymous recruitment, where we actually strip away all those personal identifiers. So we'll strip away the, the gender, for example. We'll strip away 
the name and will strip away things um, that indicate where someone has been um, brought up, for example, so address and school details and those kind of things. And when you really remove all those things, people have no choice but to judge you purely based on merit. They can't look at your name and say, this person might you know, make an assumption about your name or make an assumption about your gender or your upbringing based on where you live. So when you strip that away, you create a true um, system in which you can actually enable a meritocracy. Mm. But I would argue that under the current system, that's not always there because as human beings, we all have biases, we all have prejudices, and a lot of what we're exposed to day to day feeds those assumptions and those biases. And, you, and this is where I think we need intervention to help change that. Mm. And you mentioned intervention. I mean, quotas and things like that have been a growing part of recruitment for universities and for, for jobs, as you mentioned before, as well. So, I mean, are quotas the answer? I mean, there's always this counter-argument about inequality and how you have to apply inequality to attain equality. Um, you know, by giving people who might not have had the chance before to have the chance, they might have, uh, have to step over somebody who has more merit. How would you kind of argue that, you know, yeah. that you need to sort of treat an inequality problem with inequality? Yeah, so I guess when we talk about quotas, I specifically um, say that, and, and part of my talk was about targets in particular rather than quotas. Um, targets are aspirational. We, you know, in, in the sense that you'll have a, a women in leadership target, for example, um, gender diversity target, or targets for other diversity streams. Um, and the reason I say that, um, and I know what you're getting at around sort of, is it positive discrimination? Mm. Um, and the thing is, I would argue that positive discrimination has existed forever. Right? And if you think about it from this perspective, historically, who are the guys, or who, are the, who are the persons that are in the top ranks of society, whether it's sort of in Australia or in other Western countries? And the reality is that, you know, if you were to pose these questions to those individuals, because sometimes it is those individuals who, who come up with this, oh, but what about International Men's Day, you know, and things like that. <laughs> and, and I sort of say to them, um, and of course, this is not across the board, and I don't want to stereotype, but someone who poses that argument, I, I, I've, and I've had it ask, people have asked me, I sort of say, well, what if you didn't get your job on merit? What if, just possibly, you got your job because you're male, Anglo-Saxon, cisgender, and straight? What if? And that you could argue that's positive discrimination. You can argue that historically the system has had a preference for individuals that tick those boxes. Um, because if we had a true meritocracy, then you would see more diversity at the top. Because the current status quo assumes a few things. It assumes that women don't have merit, because if women had merit, there'd be more of them at the top. <laughs> It also assumes that culturally diverse people don't have merit, because again, if they did, there would be more of them at the top. So, either those are completely absurd conclusions, and they are, um, you know, so that's how I kind of answer that. You know, what if um, what we know is merit, or the concept of merit isn't really what we think it is? Mm -hmm. um, and you do need to create the foundation to create a true meritocracy because, um, you know, I wish we existed in a world where we didn't have to worry about positive or negative discrimination, where we didn't have to worry about quotas or targets. Um, but in, as I mentioned in my, um, when I did my TED, TEDx talk, I, I kind of ended it with, because there are lots of people who like cringe when you say the word targets, or like, oh, here we go. Um, they think it's sort of, uh, you know, like it's, at, at a superficial level. But that's, I am not asking, you know, people to put photos of diverse looking people on their websites. It's got to be real mm. diversity that creates diversity of thought. But people who mount this argument against targets, I sort of say to them, well, you know, that famous quote, the definition of insanity is doing the same thing over and over again and expecting different bloody results. And the reality is we have been doing, you know, you can't do the same thing and expect things to change. If people say, well, if you, if you got merit, you'll get to the top. Well, 
studies have proven that those who have merit aren't getting to the top because there's barriers in place. Mm. So that's why we have to try something different and that's how I mount the case, the business case and the moral case for mm. why I think targets are required. That's all we have time for. We could talk about this all day. But thank you so much for joining us here in Versailles. Please, everybody. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I didn't fall over. It's a miracle. <laughs> Thanks so much. Thank <laughs> you.